Welcome to On Your Own Terms. I'm Patty Talbot, and this is the place where we learn together what it takes to change the world on our own terms and in our own special ways. Today, I'm introducing you to Dr. Becky Taylor Smith. Becky is trained as an anesthesiologist, but as you'll learn, she is also now a coach and she is also a big advocate for taking care of the environment in the world that we share. You'll want to listen to her homegrown solutions for a patchwork world, and you'll be in for some surprises. This is Becky Taylor Smith. Welcome, Becky. from South Wales originally in the UK and um, so well known for having more sheep than people probably. So I grew up in the countryside near to the beach and had a lot of animals growing up and a lot of time in nature and so I think that probably shaped a lot of my bond with nature and my connection with it and my desire to save it and so yeah I do put a lot of that down to where I grew up and how. Yeah the way that we spent time in nature I had a big garden, lots of animals, spent a lot of time. It'd be after school, go and run around on the beach, lots of freedom, not very much routine, <laughs> I have to say. And I think that probably ability to explore and spend lots of time, quite a lot of free time, just making our own fun, helped me to realise what it's like to have that freedom and probably helped with my sort of rebellious streak that I have and wanting to have that freedom and perhaps at times growing up not having it for example at school and that kind of instilled in me I think a lot of the sense of integrity and fairness that I have in that sometimes it can feel really unfair if people aren't valued equally or allowed to express their individualism and to work on the things that they are passionate about and I felt that school really did affect that and outside of school I had so much freedom so it probably did shape a lot of my rebelliousness and how I actually want to make a change in the world and so that has been a thread actually through my life so things I'm really passionate about are fairness and uh, I've worked a lot on causes to do with yes climate change and the biodiversity loss which is something I'm really passionate about now but also previously working on like LGBT health issues and so a lot of it has had a thread through health climate change and health LGBT issues in health but the thread of it has all been around fairness and actually seeing marginalized groups or seeing unfair practices and wanting to change something about it and sometimes that needs that kind of rebellious voice to say no I'm not going to go with that status quo, I want to change things. And yes, looking back, perhaps a lot of that freedom and time in nature that I had not just shaped my kind of how I cherish nature, but also developing that sense of what lights me up, what's important to me, and actually how can I bring my individual nature to that change as well. Uh, my dad was an engineer, my mum was a fitness instructor. They were very much, I suppose, they valued health and they valued well-being and they valued giving me the ability to choose what I did in life. So rather than them actually working on similar causes, it was more the values that they instilled in me. And a lot of what they instilled in me was work hard, get a good career, make your own kind of independence, but do what you want. We don't really mind, you know, what you choose to do, which is very different to their upbringings. And they were almost rebelling against their very Victorian upbringings of you must do this and that, and you won't have the freedom to choose. So in a way that probably gave me so much freedom that then I was a bit of a trouble to them <laughs> as a teenager. <laughs> but yes, it's more about the values that, that the people around me growing up instilled in me rather than that they worked for similar causes or anything like that. And I suppose I was choosing what I wanted to do in life, as you do as a teenager. And my mum said, why don't you go 
bit further you could let's go to a college and see what they've got on offer and somebody there said you can be a doctor with your grades and it's not something I'd even thought about so it's something that my mum said why don't you think bigger why don't you go and try that so that was really empowering from her and I suppose I went into it because I wanted to help people but at that point probably didn't have a sense of exactly how and I think that's something that's really important and part of the work that I do with change makers is actually you might be passionate about something but what is it that you love to do in that passion how do you actually shape that change because there's so many ways that we can be change makers and what's right for one person isn't necessarily the right way to to make that change for another person and I suppose looking back it's interesting to see what happened next and how that all came about very gradually you don't always know looking forward how it's going to turn out do you it's only through connecting those dots backwards climate change and biodiversity loss those are issues that are very close to my heart and probably I had a very gradual awareness of that suddenly hit me maybe five or six years ago where I suddenly realized that I'm a doctor I'm an anesthetist or anesthesiologist and we waste so much at work and there's a lot of impact that we have on the environment and so I started to do some work within healthcare because the climate crisis is a health crisis and one of the things I've done more recently in the last few years is set up a network for anesthetists to look at their practice and to make it greener so how can we make it as safe for patients but actually mean that we have less impact on the environment and through doing that we then also help to save more lives because if we can reduce air pollution if we can encourage people to be more active if we can reduce biodiversity loss then we can help people to live longer and when it comes to climate change every 0.1 degree c of warming counts when it comes to health so that's a huge issue. And so that's part of the work I do as a doctor. And then I also am a coach. And so part of that came about because I, about five years ago, started burning out at work. And it's a very common problem in healthcare, I think. And part of that was that I was really trying to make a change. And actually, I was putting a lot of my energy into trying to make change and lead that change and exhausting myself with the everything that goes with it the emotions related to climate change the difficulty in being a change maker trying to do things on your own probably too much sometimes and not perhaps looking after my energy as well as I could and I actually had some really great coaching and decided shortly after that I wanted to train as a coach to help other people in this way and so that's morphed into what I currently do which is as a coach I help sensitive change makers to look after themselves so that they don't burn out while they're trying to change the world particularly helping those who care for people and who care for the planet and actually it doesn't really matter if it's climate change or biodiversity that they they care about most even if it's racism even if it's health inequalities all of those things affect the groups who are most likely to be affected by climate change in terms of health and their well-being. And so if I can empower more people who care about those issues to really sustain the change they want to make so that they can look after themselves and be in it for the long term, then the more that they will be able to change the world. And so we do that together. Yeah, so yeah. particularly for my specialty in anaesthetics, there's different ways that we can anaesthetize people for an operation. So you have general anaesthetics and the drugs that we use to give someone a general anaesthetic. Some of them are much, much higher carbon than other drugs or much more polluting for the environment, or greenhouse gases, for example. So we can use the lower carbon alternatives, which are absolutely just as safe and give just as good an anaesthetic. And a lot of the differences are in how it's been marketed rather than the difference in how the drug works other issues are things like reducing the waste that we produce so not opening things just in case we need them but actually thinking ahead to what we need which is perhaps something that low and middle income countries are used to doing but in develop in very well developed countries we've been used to just throwing things away without a second thought and that also means then moving more to reusable things like in surgery 
reusable gowns, reusable drapes that get really well cleaned and properly sterilised instead of single use plastic items all the time. And we also know that good quality care is low carbon care. So it's things like reducing complications for patients so that we're actually giving them better care, reducing their length of stay in hospital where they may be more likely to pick up infections or have falls. Or It's all the things about looking at the whole patient pathway and even things like just reducing the number of times a patient has to travel to hospital. Do they have to come for their blood test, for their heart tracing, for their nurse appointment, or can they come and get everything done in one go? that's better for patients because then they've got more free time to do what they need to do, whether it's work or leisure, but it also reduces trips to the hospital. And so that reduces carbon in the travel. So there are so many aspects. And the NHS in England was the first healthcare system in the world to declare a net zero target. So we're going to be net zero by 2040. And actually, that means a lot of policy change as well. So that means leaning on all of the companies who supply the NHS, the National Health Service, to reduce their carbon and to commit that we won't buy from companies that don't have a carbon reduction plan that falls in line with ours by 2030. So that has almost worldwide impact in terms of our suppliers. So there's so much that can be done from an individual clinician level, but also from a whole health system level. And we need all of it to get us to net zero and to make that change. I'll just give you it's really important to speak to people outside of your usual sphere and when I particularly think about climate change there are so many viewpoints on it and whether people acknowledge the science or not and whether people agree on what the solutions are and even how we should feel about it should we be hopeful or should we despair and everything in between what have I learned about it I think I've learned a lot about the role of questions and actually curiosity because it's very easy to start out in this work and know the science and to think, how can we not do something about this? We all know the science. We all must react in the same way, but it's absolutely not true. Everybody has a different way of reacting. And that doesn't just depend on personality type, but on how people have grown up and what their backgrounds are and what their occupations are. And there's a really great report. I think it's called Britain Talks Climate. And it goes into the there's 13 different groups that they've subdivided people into in the UK. And the messaging, how you should change your messaging depending on which group they might fall into. And I find that really fascinating. And another book that I found great is Why Are We Yelling? by Buster Benson it's great because it goes into a lot about when we disagree on something what actually happens on an internal level and when do people actually just stop listening to each other and you know just soaking up these resources and having a play and actually seeing what works sometimes it's difficult to remember to do it in that scenario where suddenly you feel oh no they're not agreeing with me and I feel personally attacked but actually getting some awareness of when that's happening I mean, like, oh, what, what could I try instead? Let's get curious. Why? I wonder what's going on for them. And I wonder what they're thinking about this. And I wonder how we could have a more productive discussion. And another thing that I've learned is that any action you take, no matter how small, can have a ripple effect. And you don't always know in that time. And if I think about an example, I remember once I was in the operating theatre and I was talking to my boss about, I think we're talking about dietary changes and he was saying we know that plant-based diets are lower carbon he was saying oh I I could never give up meat and dairy that's just end of conversation and I said a couple of things and then we moved on and I went away from that thinking oh it's really hard and nobody agrees and I'm not getting anywhere and then the following day someone who'd been in that operating theater who'd just been listening on the periphery but not involved in the conversation came and sat next to me and said so yesterday when you were talking about that, can you tell me more about that? I'm really interested. We had a discussion and they were really open to learn. And they said, okay, maybe I'll, with my upbringing and my culture, we eat a lot of meat. But I'm going to go away and think about what you've said. And maybe I'll cut out one meat meal a week and go from there. And it's just, okay, you never know who's listening. and You never really know 
what impact your conversations will have. And so it's just pushed me to be a bit braver and to keep having those conversations because you never know what difference it's going to make. That's awesome. So if I had my dream, it would be that all of those sensitive change makers who are currently working in the intersection between health and climate change would feel empowered to keep working on this work and would be able to recognize their sensitivity and actually that it's a superpower it's not something that hinders them and sometimes the world can make sensitive people feel like they're being too sensitive or they're taking things on too much and actually for them to realize that is a superpower that it means that they really feel and it means then they really want to change that injustice if those people could really harness that to change things that they could change the world and actually not just that they could know it was a superpower and then be able to go out and make those changes that they feel really need to change but also that they would know how to look after their energy because being sensitive, being a highly sensitive person can actually really change the way that you get stimulated by noise, by light, by, you know, everything that happens around you, how you take on other people's emotions. And so then that might change their activism. So if you think of an activist and you think that means I have to go and get a placard and go and glue myself to something and be at a big protest, Actually, as a highly sensitive person, perhaps all of that noise and overstimulation and isn't the best thing. Or it might mean that you need to plan more time after that protest to just come down from it and to calm your nervous system and to get back to baseline. Or it could mean that actually you're better suited to the activism that is behind the scenes or out in nature or whatever it is that really suits the way that you like to work and the way that you can manage your energy. And what that means then is if those people can do that, if they can recognize their sensitivity as a superpower and they also know how to look after themselves, then the ripple effect of the change they bring to the world and how they role model that as well for other people could be absolutely massive and it could actually change so much about how we lead and how we bring about change and the things that we prioritize in our leadership. So, yeah, if I had my vision for the world it would be that all of those sensitive activists who don't even know they're activists could really step up and know how to lead that change and look after themselves as well that means that anyone who's involved in activism or change making or who has sensitive people in their life who are kind of aggrieved by the changes that are happening in the world and sometimes can become paralyzed by that is how can you empower those people And I suppose if you're already in the change making activism space, it's perhaps not making activism mean one thing, actually encouraging people to think about the ways that they can make a change, no matter how small, and recognize that that your way of doing activism or change making may not be theirs, but actually, and that goes for all kind of neurodiversity, really, it's what is the way that best suits them to make that change. And whether it's small or big activism, it all makes a difference when water runs on a rock over thousands of years it wears it away right so all of those small changes that we can make in the way that suits our energy best it all counts and so encouraging those people not only to find what works for them but also to keep going to encourage them it is working it is helping you are valuable in your contribution so that's the way we can support those people And in terms of when they get paralysed by the emotions to do with climate change or any of the big changes in the world, is not to tell them you're too sensitive or it's actually to encourage them that what can they do? What will help? Actually, is it how can they get the support to feel those emotions move through them and channel them into something good? Or how can they actually calm their nervous system? And maybe that's getting out into nature or maybe it's meditation or yoga. Maybe it's connecting with like-minded people and going along in terms of climate change to a climate cafe or something like that but it's encouraging them to how do they move out of that paralysis into something that will help shift those emotions into something where they can do good with it you can see my website it's bts-coaching.co.uk and you can email me on beckytaylorsmith at gmail.com 
either to talk about coaching one-to-one or I do some group work out in nature to do with climate related emotions and moving into active hope or you can even email me about green healthcare and then I'll happily answer your questions about that as well. (laughs) Thank you Becky. As we shared in our conversation you made me think of a lot of things that I've been able to do and take tiny little steps to make my access to medical practice a little more environmentally friendly. I shared with you in our conversation that I actually was able to convince my two doctors to let me take one blood sample so that it was easier on me, but also so there was less materials used, less shipping used, and we all accomplished what we needed from one sample of Patty's blood to go to this doctor and that doctor. So there are things like that doctors can do to work with patients to reduce their environmental impact. I know that people listening to you today will be inspired to take the steps they can as change makers. And I'm especially intrigued and moved by what you've shared about how highly sensitive people can be effective change makers without becoming overwhelmed because there's place for change and there are methods for change that use the skills and gifts and sensitivities of all of us. I hope people will follow your work and consider how they can show up in the world as change makers, no matter what their needs or their personalities. There's always something we can do to take care of Mother Earth better together. Folks, I know that you can see that Becky exemplifies all of these attributes of change makers. Today, I want to especially focus on this connectedness quadrant because she has shared how communicating can catch on. Sometimes when you're talking to one person, there's another person listening in who can reap the benefits of your message as well. And that's the way the ripple effects happen. We can all be change makers but we can't do it by accident. We have to show others what we stand for. And in that way, together, we can impact those sustainable development goals. Becky's message is very much about climate action and taking care of Mother Earth, but it's also about good health and well-being for the individuals so that we don't burn ourselves out in the process of change making because we can't serve anyone if we are not whole and well ourselves. And that often requires really knowing who we are. That's the self-awareness skill of change makers, who we are and what we're capable of and how to take care of our energy so we can show up and make a difference another day and another day and another day in our own special ways. Thank you, Dr. Becky Taylor Smith. Next week, I will bring to you another change making woman changing the world on her own terms. And in the meantime, may you be grounded in your beingness, guided in your doingness, generous in your connectedness, and inspired in your reflectiveness so you can consciously change the world in your own special way, on your own terms. I'm Patty Talbot. I'm always learning, and I know you are too. <laughs>